Well, thank you. Um, this is the second time in, in a matter of about a month where um, I had to um, make up the words of the song as I went along. I'm pretty sure I said something heretical. <laughs> uh, I thought I knew where the sentence was going, and, and the next word was definitely not going to be kosher uh, at all. And uh, so forgive me. Uh, it's wonderful to be, uh, to be back here again. I think the last time I was here was preaching in a tent out here somewhere. Uh, in that crazy time, and uh, I'm looking forward to being back in January. I have just, um, I can ignore this clock, right, because this, 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 this is definitely not correct. Um, that's the one I need to see. Um, <laughs> I can barely see it. Uh, I have actually just announced my retirement from pastoral ministry. I, I'll continue with Ligonier and uh, with RTS, and I, I hope to do some supply preaching somewhere for a season. Uh, I've been in pastoral ministry for 45 years. I began in 1978 as a, as a young whippersnapper straight out of seminary. Um, I remember my first session meeting, um, Board of Elders, and uh, I'd never been in a session meeting. Seminary had not prepared me for that, uh, and I was I was all at sea. And uh, as I was telling a few folk who've heard that my last um, official date uh, at First Columbia is Christmas Eve, I'm going to wake up on Christmas Day. Um, unemployed, which uh, is um, unnerving. Uh, I have Steve Lawson counseling me. Uh, I had a FaceTime call with him last night, and I said, Steve, I, I need some counseling. I, I just can't imagine stopping preaching. So I need you to find a Baptist church somewhere. Um, <laughs> I'll just, I'll just sublimate my doctrine of infant baptism for a season. I won't mention it. It'll promise. It'll never come up. Um, but I, I need somewhere to preach. Um, Dr. Duncan called or text, I think texted a couple of months ago and asked me to do this, and, and I'm on my way to the Banner of Truth Conference somewhere south of here. And uh, he said, I, I want you to speak on the pastor theologian. And I thought, okay, well, as it happens, I happen to be preaching on Second Timothy, since I'm, I'm not about to leave prison and be beheaded, but I am about to leave uh, 45 years of pastoral ministry, and uh, it's been amazing just how relevant uh, Second Timothy has been to me personally, but also I think to the congregation uh, in reminding them of what was on the heart and mind of the Apostle Paul days, weeks, months before his death. This is Paul's third or possibly fourth imprisonment. This is his final imprisonment. Uh, the year is somewhere around 65 AD. It follows the fires uh, in the um, Circus Maximus in the center of Rome uh, that Nero blamed uh, on uh, Christians, and, and uh, Paul has been arrested. He has probably made it as far as Spain, but he's now back in prison again. This is not the imprisonment at the end of the Acts of the Apostles, which was technically a house arrest, even though he was under chains. But he was set free from that uh, imprisonment. The Jews, I don't think, ever made it to, um, to, to uh, Rome to try their case. And so 
uh, the emperor set him free. But this is different. There's something personal involved here. Uh, Nero is a megalomaniac. Um, there's no telling what he will do. And Paul, I think, realizes that this is the end of the road. And he writes to his young protege in the faith, uh, Timothy. My, my guess is that Paul is in his early 60s uh, and Timothy is in his early mid-30s and uh, wet behind the ears, as my father would have said. And um, uh, Paul is going to counsel him as he takes care of the church in uh, Ephesus. And my text, and when I mentioned the text, Dr. Duncan said, this text and others in Second Timothy are dangerously well-known at Masters. And so I bring Coles to Newcastle. You, I guess you have to be a Brit to understand that. Newcastle, <laughs> Newcastle is a place where they, where they mined coal. It's, it's all, it's all non-woke now, so they don't, they don't, they don't mine coal anymore. Um, but if you, you're, you're bringing coals to, coal, to Newcastle is, is an apt uh, aphorism for uh, me preaching on Second Timothy to all of you wonderful young men uh, on the verge of ministry. I have to say you dress a whole lot better than RTS students. Uh, and next time I'm in class uh, in RTS Charlotte, I, I, will, I will tell them so. <laughs> um, my text is 2 Timothy 1, 13 through 18, though we'll focus mostly on verses 13 and 14. So this is the word of God. Follow the pattern of of sound of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, God, the good deposit, entrusted to you. You are aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes, May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesephorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me earnestly and found me. May the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you well know all the service he rendered at Ephesus. Well, may God grant his blessing upon the reading of his holy and inerrant word. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, and this was early in his ministry, this was before he was at um, the, the Metropolitan Tabernacle in South London. This is um, when he was in his late teens and early 20s in Exeter Hall, and he wrote, and uh, Spurgeon, as you well know, Spurgeon, when he was a younger man, was a firebrand, five-point um, Calvinist with a vengeance. I love the early Spurgeon. When you read the later Spurgeon, he is a little more flowery in his language. He has that... Uh, Victorian sense of, of uh, what a sentence should look like. It is still Spurgeon, he's still Calvinistic, but it doesn't quite have that, that young man's take-no-prisoner um, Calvinism that you find in those, early, in those early six or seven years of his ministry. And uh, he says in this stage in his life, if God teaches it, it is enough. If it is not in the Word, away with it. But if it be in the word, agreeable or disagreeable, systematic 
or disorderly, I believe it, and so should you. The background here, we've said something about the background, but the immediate background is that Paul says that all in Asia have forsaken him, verse 15. And Asia would be the equivalent of Western Turkey uh, today, um, a much smaller piece of geography than what we would consider as Asia. Uh, and it's probably also a piece of hyperbole that not every single individual in Asia has uh, abandoned him. Uh, but he does mention Phygelus Fy and Hermogenes, and they are probably um, leaders. One can imagine, and one is now imagining, what the motivation might have been. They were ashamed of Paul's chains. You'll remember in 2 Timothy how on several occasions he exhorts Timothy not to be ashamed of his chains. And Paul isn't asking for sympathy. That, that's above the Apostle Paul. Paul is saying to Timothy, don't be afraid to suffer for the gospel. Don't pull back your message. Don't water down your message. Don't avoid saying things that you need to say because you're afraid that you're going to be punished for it. Don't be ashamed of my chains. And one imagines that in that context that, that Phygelus and Hermogenes have watered down the message and in doing so have brought disparagement to the Apostle Paul in his final hours in prison in Rome. Perhaps, too, they saw opportunistic attempts to get for themselves fame and glory. And if Hermogenes and Phygelus were young, and one imagines that they were, the church in Ephesus is relatively young, Timothy is relatively young, the desire for fame and glory can result in very bad choices. What they want is Christianity light. Like Bud Light. Can I say that in, in this hall? Expunge it from the recording if I can't say that. But, but Christianity light. And do you know where that gets you? J.C. Ryle at the end of the 19th century was a reformed Calvinistic bishop in Liverpool. His book on holiness is one of the greatest uh, top 20 books of all time. I was hoping that you would make a note of that. Um, you know, it's a book that begins with a chapter on sin. You know, if, if, if you're writing it, Crossway would say to you, you know, you can write a chapter on sin, but it's going to come in at number 9 or 10, but it's not going to be the first chapter. You know, you've got, to, you've got to start with something positive. You've got to draw people in, into the book. And he starts his very opening sentence. And I'm ad-libbing the sentence, but he who would make great strides in holiness must first of all understand the depths of his depravity. That's the opening sentence. And J.C. Ryle in that book talks about now, I need to, again, um, translate a Britishism. Jelly in Britain is what you call gelatin. You know, you know the wobbly stuff. <laughs> if you go with what you call jelly, which is jello, where, where the, it doesn't work. But what he said was that there were Christians in the 19th century who were more like gelatin, they were evangelicals, but the emphasis was on the jelly part. They wobbled whichever way the wind blowed. And there are tens of thousands of churches in this country just like that, whose aim is to keep people happy. 
at whatever cost to avoid certain difficult, awkward truths and hard work and possible opposition for the sake of fame and glory. And my dear friends, and I count you as my dear friends, they're in our circles too. And there go I but for the grace of God. So let's look at the two commands in verses 13 and 14. In verse 13, follow the pattern of sound words. And in verse 14, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Let's, let's look at this together. And, and Dr. Duncan tells me this is your meat and potatoes. Follow the pattern of sound words. Sound words, and the Greek, the Greek is hygiene, um, uh, from which we uh, get our our English word hygiene. Well, we all know about hygiene. Americans didn't know how to wash their hands until 2020, <laughs> and now I'm obsessed with an eye watch that tells me I have to wash my hands for 20 seconds, and it yells at me if I stop. Unhealthy habits and ways of life, but here, unhealthy words. That'll make you sick. He says in chapter 2 and verse 17 about certain people making divisions and creating obstacles and their talk uh, will, will be like gangrene, he says, like gangrene. Follow the pattern of sound words. Sound words that he's heard, of course, from the Apostle Paul. And notice he uses the word pattern. There's a pattern to sound words. There's a, a form to it. It has, it has a definable, um, systematic understanding. And as somebody who teaches systematic theology, I, I want to take that a little the pattern of sound words. It's not important for you to know what the sound words are. It's not... Imp Let me say that again. It's important for you to know what sound words are, but there's, m there's something more important than sound words. There's the pattern of sound words. How the sound words fit together. There's a sense in which the Apostle Paul is asking you to ascend 36,000 feet and take a look at the lay of the land and the topography all around it. And there are sound words, but there is a pattern to the sound words. There are those, and I, I've come across them in my ministry, typically in the way of an argument about something or another, a discussion about something or another, and what has emerged is no creed but the Bible. Well, that is in itself a creed. Every pastor is a theologian. It's the title of Assis Sproul's wonderful book. Every Everyone's a theologian, he says. But every pastor, especially, is a theologian. This is, um, this is the burden of the Apostle Paul in his dying hours. He writes to Titus, a letter written roughly the same time as 2 Timothy. And he says in chapter 2 and verse 1, you must say the things that are consistent with sound teaching. Sound teaching. Theology 
must be your concern. It's the vision of the pastor theologian. Like Athanasius, or Augustine, or Luther, or Calvin, or Edwards, or Spurgeon, or John MacArthur, or R.C. Sproul, the pastor theologian. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. The things that you've heard from me, Timothy, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. There are four generations in mind when Paul says that. There's Paul, there's Timothy, faithful men, and others also. Paul is dying. He knows he's dying. And for Paul, life without Paul was going to mean difficulty for the church. He knew that. He understood that. This wasn't pride on his part. He was an apostle. Paul was self-aware that he was writing Scripture. He chastised the Thessalonians for daring to contradict him. That's how confident he was, that when he, that when he spoke, when he wrote, he was writing the Word of God. And what would life without the Apostle Paul look like in the fledgling church, that, that church that still didn't have a canon of the New Testament, and there'd be another generation before that canon would be formed? And he's concerned about pastor theologians, and that those pastor theologians would be passed on from one generation to another, that training would take place. Timothy would find faithful men who will be able to find other faithful men. And so it'll go on. Why? Because the time is coming when they will not endure sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they'll accumu accumulate to themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. Well, you and I both know that's not just an exhortation for the middle of the first century. But that is an exhortation for 2023. That's the vision you take with you as you leave the Master's Seminary and embark on a life of ministry and usefulness. And let me say again, for a person of my age, it's extraordinarily encouraging to see a generation of folk in their 20s and 30s, less than half of my age, who are ready to go to battle, who are ready to become the, that Christian soldier, that pastor theologian with the pattern of sound words. Well, let's look in the second place at the second command. By the Holy Spirit that dwells in you, keep or guard the good deposit entrusted to you. This, of course, is the language of stewardship, that you've been entrusted with something. And when you've been entrusted with something that is valuable, you want to make sure that you, you keep it. In my living room is a Bible. It's a large Bible. Um, it's about the size of a pulpit Bible, and it belonged to my grandfather on my father's side. My grandfather lived until he was 96. He... Uh, lived on a little farm. Uh, we inherited the rest of the farm, but he kept about 12, 15 acres. And um, he was self-sufficient. He had chickens and pigs and cows. He made his own butter, um, had an orchard, so he had plenty of, of uh, apples and pears and 
He salted the pig every year. It hung in the kitchen, in the in the larder. He had no refrigerator. Uh, he never had indoor plumbing. I went to see him at one time when I was about to go to college. I would have been 17, almost 18. And I said to him, uh, and I called him Dad, which is a, w a Welsh way of referring to your grandfather. I said, Dad, I'm going to Aberystwyth University, which was 38 miles away. And he said, that's the furthest I've ever been away from home. 38 miles. And he lived until he was 96, never went to hospital. But on the kitchen table, there was a Bible, a Welsh Bible, that was always open. And by this time of life, he had become very arthritic and, and really was not able to sit uh, in a pew any longer. So he had a recording. It was an actor, but he had a recording of Christmas Evans, who was a very famous Welsh preacher in the 19th century, uh, reformed and, and very evangelistic. And an actor took one of his sermons and, and preached it in the style that he assumed Christmas Evans would have, would have preached it. And he had played this record hundreds of times. So when he died, I, I inherited his Bible, and it sits in my living room, and if my house is on fire and I'm there, I'm going to grab that Bible and take it out. I'll call the wife and the dogs, but <laughs> I feel as though I've been entrusted with that Bible, and there's something special about it. And Paul is saying to Timothy, by the Holy Spirit that dwells in you, and let's pause there for a second. Paul is never saying to Timothy, you've got to do this by your own strength. You've got to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You've got to find that inner strength which lies within you. No, this is the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the Spirit's work. The Spirit who is the source of these sound words and the source of the pattern of sound words. There's something precious about these words. Now, as you read through Second Timothy, you, of course, understand that what Paul ultimately is talking about is not just the words that he's heard Paul preach. Yes, certainly those. But this epistle, Second Timothy, which will be taken to Ephesus and, and, and read, and in it, in the third chapter, he will read those remarkable words that all Scripture is breathed out by God. Theopneustos. That all Scripture is the product of God exhaling. That when the Bible speaks, God speaks. And therefore, it is inerrant. Keep, guard that good deposit that was entrusted to you. How do churches fall away? One generation believes the gospel. A second generation assumes the gospel. A third generation denies the gospel. It just takes a generation or two. That's all it does. What was the mantra of the World Council of Churches? That doctrine divides and mission unites. Peter Lee, the Bishop of Virginia, wrote recently, Heresy is better than schism. Well, at least he's honest. Heresy is better than schism. Timothy has a responsibility to guard the good deposit. Yes, he's talking about Scripture, but he's also talking about the understanding of Scripture. 
the pattern of sound words, the theology that emerges from Scripture, doctrines like the Trinity that are not explicitly found in the Scripture, doctrines like women can partake of the Lord's Supper. There's no verse in the New Testament that says that. That's an inference, a theological inference based on the data of Scripture. You recall that Titus was told, holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. Sound exhortation of doctrine and refutation of bad doctrine. That's the mission. Now, let me ask, because we're at seminary. I loved seminary. I had a very positive experience of seminary. I had a very, very good, um, basic, uh, reformed um, education at, at seminary. There were a couple of classes that we won't talk about, but but on on the whole, on the whole, I came away feeling I'd received a very good grounding. What does Paul mean by follow the pattern of sound words? What does he mean by guarding the good deposit? I believe he's talking about, yes, guarding the Bible, but more than that, guarding the teaching of the Bible, the pattern of sound words. Paul will say later in this epistle, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, for correction, for instruction in the way of righteousness that the man of God might be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. There's a rhythm to the gospel. And New Testament holiness is based on theology, the theology of the indicative comes before the imperative. That we must know who we are in Jesus Christ before we can know what we can become in Jesus Christ. The pattern of the first three chapters of Ephesians as theological foundation, followed by the fourth, fifth, and sixth chapter of Ephesians giving us the practice of that pattern of sound words, or Romans 1 through 11, followed by Romans 12 through 16. Good theology leads to good health, and bad theology leads to disease and sickness. Now, Scripture makes a very strong case that you and I need to be able to discern truth from error, to do it winsomely, to do it in a Jesus-like manner, for sure. Timothy is in Ephesus. He writes, Jesus writes a letter 30 years later. Well, I, I, I give myself away here. For I believe that Revelation was written in the 90s and not in the 60s, and uh, it, it seems to me that the evidence is that it was Emperor Domitian rather than Emperor Nero. I, I once said this to R.C. Sproul, and I thought my friendship was over forever. <laughs> but let's, for the sake of these few minutes assume that I'm right, and then, and then you, can, you can argue for uh, a date of revelation in the, in the late 60s rather than the early 90s. 
And Jesus wrote a letter to the church in Ephesus, where Timothy was, commending the church for being intolerant of false teachers and hating the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And what that tells you is that Timothy heeded the admonition of the Apostle Paul that 30 years later, that church was strong, sound, solid, vibrant. That's what I want for you. That's what my heart yearns for you. Churches, and there are all kinds of churches, and you'll be called into all kinds of different situations. I've been in three congregations. I've been a solo pastor for 17 years. And by solo pastor, I was the only person on the payroll. So no secretary, no youth guy, uh, no college guy. I I did it all. Um, I much prefer the situation I've been in 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 the second two churches. I was with Ligon Duncan at, at first Presbyterian in Jackson, Mississippi, for 16 years. As the evening preacher, that was a delight. And for the last 12 years, I've been in First Pres Columbia, uh, where there are six ministers and a staff of, I I don't know how many staff, but, but you're never lonely. What Paul is calling for here is discernment discernment, the pattern of sound words. You need to be able to discern it. You must love theology. Biblical theology and systematic theology and historical theology, all of it. Because don't don't get into the habit of pitting one against another and putting them in the ring with gloves on and see duke it out and see who can win. No. Good systematic theology is based on good biblical theology. And it's also based on good historical theology. William Perkins, and I've had a love for William Perkins for a decade or more. He was born in uh, 1558 and died in 1602. So he didn't even make 50 years. But he made a mark. If you had been a Puritan wanting to enter the ministry in the late 1500s, you, and, and you were living in England, you would have gone to either Oxford or Cambridge and you would have had Reformed theology in both. But had you gone to Cambridge, you would have sat under the ministry of William Perkins. I've had the blessing of being part of the editorial process of bringing all of his works, that have, some of which have never been translated from uh, hieroglyphics that were taken down, shorthand that was taken down uh, in the 16th century, but never actually made it into print. And uh, uh, Yule uh, has now finished, I think, his 10th volume of Perkins's works. And he defines theology as the science of living blessedly forever. This is a reformed, supralapsarian theologian. And he defined theology as the science of living blessedly forever. That's your task. That's why you need to hold fast to the sound pattern of sound words, to hold fast to guard the good deposit that has been given to you. It's a charge to fall in love with theology. So let me finish by asking, what exactly should pastors do to become better theologians? Read. Read. Read until your eyes hurt. 
and read not just for sermon preparation. Now, I know how difficult it is. In my first charge, I had three sermons a week to prepare. And preparation for sermons 45 years ago was a lot more difficult than it is today because you didn't know stuff. And there wasn't access to the internet as there is now. If I need a fact, I, I just Google it. Okay, I've got, I've got the fact. So it's a, it's a quicker process and, and with age, hopefully comes a, 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 a better way of un understanding scripture. But read. Ministry is busy, very busy. And there's lots of meetings, and there's always something to do. But you need to, you need to um, guard those morning hours when you're preparing a sermon. Uh, I, I've had students tell me that it takes them 36 hours to prepare a sermon. I have no idea what they're doing. But a, a good morning of arduous study should be able, you should be able to produce a sermon. But you should have a morning where you're reading something other than sermon preparation. When I, when I left seminary in 1978, uh, Ian Murray was on campus. And I'd known him a little for a few years, and um, I sat at lunch with him, and I was about to graduate, and he was there for a conference. And he gave me a piece of advice. He said, let me give you a piece of advice. And he said, make one theologian your hobby. M ministry's busy. So make one theologian your hobby, pr preferably a dead one. Someone who's written prolifically, pro prolifically. Someone who's covered, you know, most of the basic issues of theology. So that's what I did. I I began. I, I had a morning uh, where I read John Owen, and then, for reasons that we don't have time to go into, I then changed to Calvin, and Calvin became and remains my hobby, and uh, life is busy, life is going to get less busy for me, uh, hopefully in a few months' time, and I can, I can go back to Calvin and enjoy everything that he has ever said. Now, I brought Coles to Newcastle today to underline what you already know. Um, I'm praying for you uh, as you train uh, in this wonderful seminary to be the best pastors that you can possibly be and to be on fire for the gospel and to be steadfast in an evil age. And we are currently in an evil age, I think. And you will need all the strength of the Holy Spirit that he can bring you. So let's pray. Father, we we thank you for these words of the apostle just prior to his death. The concern that he had for the church, the concern that he had for young Timothy especially, and the concern that he had for those to whom Timothy would minister, and his concern for the pattern of sound words, his concern for uh, a loyalty to guard the good deposit that had been given to him. Well, so grant us grace to be those guardians of the good deposit and to hold fast to that which is good. For Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen.